AP calculus AB unit A day two um, lesson. So let's see. So we're going to do uh, integral estimations today. So we've started talking about integrals. We're going to talk about integral estimations. We've started talking about integrals and just how to do them. But it's not going to always be enough to just follow the formula. <clears throat> so some ways that we can estimate the area under a curve without actually having formulas, maybe we just some, have some of the values, is called these uh, rectangular approximations. So rectangular means we're using rectangles. And we could use a lot, we could use not that many. So I'm going to go with three sub intervals. That means there's going to be three slices, three rectangles. And so, you know, let's, let's say that they're about equal widths. This will not be something you have to decide in the future, but this is just a quick demonstration. Um, <clears throat> There's three different ways we could create the rectangles for these three slices. We could use the left end to determine the height of each one. The left side will give you the height of each rectangle. And the area of this would be the area that would be an estimate for the end of the original curve. Now, some of the slices are not enough. Some of them are too much. And in the end, it's not going to be exact. Some will, some will, it might be be more or less than the actual answer. The more slices we do, the better it gets. If we did a right end estimate, that would mean use the right side as your height. And so you get three different rectangles and the area underneath them would be your estimate. So it depends. It, it, this usually is going to give you a different number. If you use right instead of left. The third way we could set up rectangles is by using the midpoint. And that would be saying in the middle of the rectangle, use the height of the curve as your rectangle. So that one look like that. So in the middle of your rectangle, wherever the curve is, that's going to be the height of your rectangle. Okay. Now, I would say a lot of people would think that midpoint rectangles are better because they kind of split the above and under. They, they're not so extreme, right? The left and right ones had a lot, a lot of area they missed or a lot of area they added. The midpoint ones kind of balance it out. So I, you know, I would say they're better if you don't do a whole lot of slices. They're better, you know. You know, if you do. You know, we could illustrate if you do one slice, you're going to get lots of error. One sub interval. One slice, one sub interval. Because if you use the, uh, you know, say the, the left end point, that's a lot of error, right? You're missing all that error. If you do the right end, that's a lot of error because you're getting all this extra. If you do the midpoint, yeah, that's better. You know, you get a little over, a little under, kind of bounces out. Might, might seem kind of close to the answer. Now, if we were to do two slices, it really starts to cut down on the air. So like on the left end here, there's a ton of air. But if we did two slices with left end, all this area you're missing, well, we kind of get a lot of it. Now we're just missing those two chunks of area. So it's a lot better, right? Now, if we go to in infinite slices, you actually eliminate the error. The error goes to zero. The more slices you do, the smaller the error gets. If you go to an infinite slices that are infinitely thin, infinitely many, you actually get the exact answer. So. Um, now let's see, uh, on the graph, on my graphing calculator, I could, you know, just demonstrate, I don't know if I have this. Let me double check, um, in my program menu. No, I don't have it. Anyways, there's, there's this program that it, uh, I'm pretty sure I don't have it with me, but this program where, uh, it's called area. It doesn't come with the calculator. So it was programmed by you know, a student or someone else, and you can share these programs. And it would ask you where you want to 
start the area. So let's say we're trying to find the area under uh, parabola. You'd enter the parabola into your y equals menu. And then let's say we're trying to find the area from 1 to 10. So left would be 1, right would be 10. And then you say, well, how many subintervals do you want? We could do like 10. Press enter. And it graphs it. And if you hit enter again, it shows you the left end uh, Riemann sum. And then it shows, if you hit right, enter again, it shows you the right, uh, right endpoint. And the right endpoint should be an overestimate. The midpoint gives you something kind of in the middle, which isn't probably surprising. And then there's this other one called trapezoid, which we haven't done yet. But it actually connects these and creates little trapezoids, which is even better. But pretty close to midpoint. Um, and it's just cool kind of program just to illustrate it. If you did a hundred sub intervals, these all start to go get really close to each other. Like it doesn't really matter what your approach is. If you do a hundred sub intervals, these are all going to be pretty close to each other. And in the short term, if you don't do that many sub intervals, then yeah, there's a big difference. Now to do this by hand, this is the way you'd write it. You say, well, we're going to integrate x squared to find the area underneath it. We want to go from 1 to 10. These are called the limits. You're going to find the antiderivative. What, what, would you un, what do you get if you undo the derivative? Or what would you take the derivative of to get x squared? It would be x cubed. Bump it up 1. Divide by the new exponent. Now, usually you write the plus c here. But on these ones, we don't have to. Because we're actually going to plug numbers in. So this is called a definite integral. Whereas the other ones with the plus C are indefinite. You're going to plug 10 in first, the top one in first, the bigger area first. We were talking about this yesterday. Find this area first, 0 to 10. That would be 1,000 over 3 plus C. Then you're going to find, then you're going to plug 1 in to find this little area right here and subtract it from here to get the area in between. So you plug 1 in. It also has the plus C. And then the plus C goes away because you have plus C and a minus C now. Your final answer is 999 over 3, which is 333. This is the exact answer that we were trying to estimate right here. But there's another way called Simpson's method. You guys can check that out on your own if you like tonight. There's lots of different ways to try and estimate the area. Now, just to reiterate, we were talking about this the other day. You want to find the area under curve. Uh, Newton discovered that the derivative of the area formula was equal to the original function of the curve, which is a huge deal, right? So this area formula is going to be x cubed over 3, right? What would you take if you undo the derivative? You get the area formula. So... <clears throat> Um, that's a big deal. Now, there's this new method. Um, you're not going to use it yet. Um, I think it showed up on the first night's homework, but we could have avoided it. But I want to keep showing it to you because it's a big deal. And uh, I don't think you should have to use it on today's assignment yet, but it's going to be one of the most used integration techniques. And it's this idea. It's kind of like the chain rule backwards. It's like the reverse chain rule. Where you have an inner function and you have an outer function and so what you do is you identify the inner function and you make that your u now by the way on last night's homework if you did a problem like this you would have multiplied it all out first that was sort of the plan but multiplying this all out first with the ninth power is not fun you probably want to use pascal's triangle which i'm sure most of you don't find fun so I don't want to do that that way. No way. I don't want to do that. So this is a way to help us. The inner function is your u. Then, so what we're going to do is we're going to re, we're going to translate this into this new thing with a bunch of u's, and it should make it simpler. Okay. So u takes place at the complicated inside. Du, even the dx has to go away. Is going to be the derivative of this is going to be two x dx. Now I have an x and a dx, which is good, but I don't want the 2, so I'm going to divide by 2. So when I rewrite this, I'm going to replace x dx with 1 half du. I'm going to replace 1 plus x squared with u. I'm going to put the 1 half out in front, 
just because that's simpler, but the number, and then u to the ninth du. So we've translated it into this much simpler problem, which is pretty easy. This is power rule. You bump it up one and you divide by the new exponent plus c. Now we need to change it back into terms of x. So the u has to get replaced back with what we defined it as originally for your final answer. So that's how we do it. Um, and we're going to be doing that a lot. I don't think you necessarily need it for today's assignment, but we are going to use it a lot. Let's look at uh, just a few more examples just to help you kind of get the hang of these problems. So um, this first one, I'm giving you the derivative and I want you to undo it. Now we haven't talked about a reverse product chain or quotient rule, and you don't you don't need to. What you want to do, you know, we're going to integrate this, right? We're going to integrate this. What we want to do is distribute the division. So x cubed divided by x first is x squared plus three uh, over x dx. Um, we might want to rewrite the you know uh, x is in the bottom as negative exponents, right, negative one. And then what some people would be tempted to do is they say, well, this is x cubed over three, bump it up to one, divide by the new exponent. The three is just hanging out, bump it up one, divide by the new exponent, division by zero, no. Oh, that's right, this is natural log. It's a special case, you gotta watch out for it. So it's gonna be x cubed over three plus three natural log of the absolute value of x. You have to have the absolute values when you do this one, plus c. This is the answer. So watch out, okay? Division by zero doesn't make sense, okay? And you shouldn't just get away with that, okay? Doesn't make sense, can't use power rule here, and it should jump out at you if you try. Okay. Um, all right. Let's look at a couple more. Try them out. Um, this doesn't really look like anything, any derivatives that we know, if you look at our list from yesterday. But sometimes you got to get creative. So you might think about splitting it up and actually rewriting it in more kind of complicated trig expressions, like the reciprocal trig expressions. One of our cosine is secant. Sine over cosine is tangent. And secant tan is the derivative of secant plus c. So sometimes it's a trig, especially you gotta get creative. Sometimes if it came like that, I would replace everything as sine, x, sine and cosine. Okay, now this one, um, this is the same problem. So I'm just trying to illustrate this u substitution thing again too which I don't think you really need yet today, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a huge deal. So we just did it here, but we could try U substitution. So check this out. If we made, you know, this is the same thing as cosine X squared. So if we're like, well, what's inside of something else? Well, cosine is inside. And then if you take the derivative of it, hopefully you get the other stuff. Derivative of cosine is negative sine. Now, I don't want the negative. I want sine dx is going to get replaced with negative du. So I'm going to put the negative out in front. du, the u is right here where the cosine is, and it's getting squared. And then I'd rewrite that as u to the negative 2. This is a power rule. I'd bump it up 1, divide by the new exponent, plus c. Negative, negative becomes positive. We've got to rewrite it back in terms of the original variable and it'd be u to the first power in the denominator. It's going to be cosine x. Now, you might be like, oh, that doesn't look the same. Well, 1 over cosine is secant x. So they are the same. Um, and I think this was probably the easier way to do it than to try and imagine to break it up and rewrite it as secant tan. I think that was probably actually harder. We're going to use this approach a lot. It's going to be really handy. 
Now on today's assignment, you might get some second derivatives and you have to find the original one. So you have to undo the second derivative to get to the first derivative, then you gotta undo the first derivative to get the original. Now you have some initial conditions here which are gonna help you find the C values. And you should find them as you get them, as they pop up. So the first derivative is gonna be the integral of the second derivative, right? So that's gonna be the integral of x plus cosine x dx. You should put parentheses around it. So we're gonna bump it up one, power rule, divide by the new exponent. This is gonna be plus sine x because the derivative sine is positive cosine. Check your answers, take the derivative of this, see if you get what you had, plus c. Let's find the c right now using the initial value for f prime, because that's what we have. So we're gonna plug zero in f prime, which is gonna give us zero squared over two, plus sine of zero, plus c, should all add up to two, right? Now that zero and that zero, so this time it's very easy, c equals two. So we're gonna rewrite our first derivative, is uh, we could probably write it as one half, x squared plus sine x plus 2. So you want to find that c value right away. Now we're halfway done. So we're going to do it again. If you want to find the original function, you're going to integrate the derivative. Right? Integrals undo derivatives. So we got to integrate 1 half x squared plus sine x plus 2 dx. Put it in parentheses. So the antiderivative of this is going to be, one, there's a one half, and then it's power rule, bump it up one, divide by the new exponent, minus cosine x, because the derivative of cosine gives you a negative sign. Now I don't want that negative, so I add an extra negative here. I don't memorize that one so much. Plus 2x plus c. Now this c right here is not the same as that c, and if that bothers you, then put, call this c sub 1 and call this c sub 2, but really, I'm just going to put c's. This is a different C. And we use this initial condition for F0 to find it because we're dealing with the original function now. So we're going to plug F0 in and we get 1 6, 0 cubed minus cosine 0 plus 2 times 0 plus C should add up to 1. That goes away, that goes away. This is 1. So you got to have to add 1 to both sides and c equals two. Now it's a coincidence it came out the same. Usually it doesn't, okay? This might be the only time it ever does, so please don't take this as like that's the way it always does. These c's are different c's. This time they happen to come out the same. So your final answer is one sixth x cubed minus cosine x plus two x plus two. That's the final answer. So this is a lot like, I think, problem 49. So now you have an idea. Now most of the, you know, a good amount of the problems on science homework are odd, but there's gonna be a fair amount of evens. So I'll probably try and upload the even answers for you to check against. Um, but that's it. So tonight's pretty much more practice with what we were doing yesterday. The use substitution stuff should probably come in yet, but hopefully you're starting to get a rough idea of what it's like. So when we need it, you'll be ready.